In this session, we want to look at holiness and purity in the New Testament. We'll begin by doing a thought experiment that I call, What is it? Then we'll talk about what it is, meaning what is holiness, what is purity. Then we'll focus in on holiness in the Gospels, and then look at holiness in the Pauline Epistles. So for our thought experiment called, What is it? I'm going to show you two pictures. Uh, I think it's probably best if you, if you pause when those pictures come up and just study them for a little bit uh, because you don't want to rush to the answer too quickly. So study those pictures and ask yourself, what is it that I'm looking at? So go ahead and, and uh, look at those. Pause me for a moment and see what you think. In the picture on the left, did you notice that there's a cross in the background? What does that tell you? You're looking at a Christian church. But did you see what's on the floor? What do you call that stuff that's on the floor? Yeah, I, I call it dirt. Well, I don't know what you'd call it, but I'd call it dirt. Actually, as it happens, uh, for those of you that aren't here at APNTS Central Campus, uh, you may not recognize that that's our chapel here on campus. And this was right after a typhoon had come through, causing major flooding, and our chapel flooded. There was about, about a foot or maybe two feet of water in our chapel. And as it, as it uh, drained out, it left behind all of this dirt. What about the second picture? What's that? Well, once again, it's, it's here on campus. Uh, and these are students. Uh, some, as you can see, are a little more industrious than the others, but uh, it's here on campus and they are, they're in the dirt? Huh? Is that dirt? Hmm. Well, the first picture, it's the same stuff. It's the same stuff. It passed through, left that same stuff in the chapel. But in the chapel, it's inside, in what is sometimes called a sacred space. In the other picture, it's the same stuff, but it's where it's supposed to be. So we call the first one dirty. But the second one, we don't call it dirty. So that brings up this important question about purity. What is pure and what is impure? Well, we can see that dirt, at least insofar as it makes something dirty, we associate that with impure. But as we saw in those pictures, something that is, has, shall we call it earth? So we don't use the term dirty or dirt. Earth, it's the same stuff, right? Earth. If it's in one place, we call it impure. If it's in another place, we can't call it impure. In fact, it's going to grow vegetables. By the way, that's what those students were doing. They were getting ready to plant some, uh, at least some trees. I'm not sure if it was, uh, uh, I should say, some plants. I'm not sure that it was uh, uh, fruits or vegetables. But it was, it was the right thing. So we can say that purity has to do with the right stuff in the right place and the wrong stuff in the, huh, not in the right place, shall we say. So we can see that purity so often in our minds has to do with boundary markers. So that chapel, we mark off. This is sacred space, we say. And in sacred space should not be certain things. They're fine outside where they're going to be growing things, but in here, not so much. So we draw boundary. So, so often, purity and impurity has to do with the lines that we draw. We draw lines between people. We draw lines about space. So many things that we're drawing lines like that. My professor, one of my professors used to say that it's about the right people at the right time, in the right place, with the right actions, and doing the right stuff. 
or rather doing the right actions with the right stuff. Yeah, that's purity. All of those things being right. That's, that captures what we think about purity so often. But is that the New Testament way of looking at purity? Let's take a look at Jesus. What about Jesus? What was his view of purity? What was his view of holiness? The first thing that we can say about that is that Jesus had greater concern for people than for purity. To take an example, remember the woman with the flow of blood. Twelve years she had been suffering, the text says. She reached out and touched Jesus. Wow, touching Jesus. What was his concern? He was, he stopped, right? Said, who touched me? But he did not condemn her. Remember from the, from the Old Testament conception, flow of blood means impure. But Jesus was concerned about that woman. Secondly, what comes out of the mouth is what defiles, not what goes into the mouth. So in the Old Testament conception, again, purity had to do with what you can eat and what you can't eat. But for Jesus, he's not concerned about that so much. He's concerned about what we say. And we can see there again his concern for people more than concern for stuff. Why? Because we can wound people with our words. Or we can build them up with our words. So holiness and purity has to do with how we treat people. Do we build them up? That's going toward holiness. And finally for Jesus, and this is so beautiful, that which is pure purifies that which is impure. <laughs> we see this again in that same story of the woman. What, what normally happens? If you are impure and you touch someone, you contaminate that person. What do they have to do? They have to wash themselves and they're unclean until nightfall. Something like that. But not Jesus. Jesus purified her when they touched. His purity was not damaged by being touched by someone who was impure. You know, that's a beautiful thing for us. We talk a lot about holiness, being the holy people of God. And so often we get that turned upside down. We don't, we don't see it as Jesus saw it because we think, Somehow, to be holy means we have to not do this and we have to not do that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about when He talks about holiness. He's talking about us purifying others. In many ways we can do that, but by speaking words of truth into their life, encouragement, wholeness. So rather than uh, rather than a fragile purity, sometimes we walk around like this. If, uh, if we get touched, oh no, I'm impure. Oh, dear Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And we feel like we're dirty all of the time. And somehow, oh, our, our holiness is broken. It's broken. It's fragile. It's somehow so weak. But no, we should have a robust, strong Holiness, a strong purity. Because when we touch that, it's pure. We touch that, it's pure. We touch that, it's pure. Yeah, that's the way our holiness should be. Of course, that takes a lot of work on our part because we need to analyze what it is that we're touching. That person, how can we speak holiness into their lives? What can we do? What can we say that will bring wholeness and holiness to them? Yeah, it takes us a sensitivity to the person. It takes a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Because really, we can't do this. It's not us. It's only God through us that works this way. So we become the conduit for holiness 
being transferred from God, who is holy, to, to effect, to bring about holiness in the world. So that's, that's the kind of holiness that Jesus wants for us. How about, how about changing gears and looking at Paul? To get us thinking about holiness in Paul, in the Pauline epistles, address this question. How often do you sin? Uh, don't, don't tell me, <laughs> but, but just think, how often do you sin? Now take a look at these pictures, or this picture rather. Uh, there's two bottles here. Which one is pure? <laughs> which, one looks, which one looks good to you? Hmm. Well, the one on the left, oh, that's terrible. It's not pure at all. Look at all those yellow balls inside that jar of, of blue balls. Wow, terrible. You can even see those red ones all over the place. Ah, terrible. So impure, isn't it? But this is, this is a picture. I, I did a little calculation based on the, the uh, concentration of the yellow dots within the blue dots and the red dots within the blue dots. In that first bottle, the, the yellow dots, the ones that you, you can see so many of those, that, just by analogy, that's sinning one day per week. <laughs> are, you, are you good enough? <laughs> are you good enough that you can only sin one day out of the week? Wow. If you only sin one day out of the week, very bad. <laughs> Everybody can see that. Mm. How about red? Red's not so good either in that bottle. Still very, very noticeable. You know what red represents? Red represents four days out of a whole year. Can you be so good that only four days of sin in the whole year? That's a pretty tall order. That's, that's tough to do. Only four days of sin? But look at it. Ah. How dirty, how impure, how, how unworthy we are if we can only four days in a year. Everybody can see. You know, we, we think, nobody can see my, my, my little sin. But I tell you, we can't hide. We can't hide it. Everybody sees. It's so obvious. But how about this? Maybe you are so perfect, so good. So, so very, very good. You only sin a single minute. Only one minute out of two whole years. You can go two whole years, and in those two years, only one minute was sin. The rest of the time, perfect. That's the one on the right. You may say, that one we can hide. That's good enough. As it happens, I actually... Not these very ones, but I actually held bottles just like this in my hands. And we were invited to look at those things. And they told us about, they didn't tell us about sin and, and, uh, and uh, purity and that kind of thing. This was actually talking about uh, uh, science. It was a science uh, demonstration. And they were talking about concentration and things like that. But they passed this, these bottles around. And they told us, you know, this... Uh, there's only one red dot. There's only one red ball in this whole jar. And I thought to myself, huh, I could sit here all day and never find that red dot. It's, it, it'll never show up. Buried inside, it could be way deep, deep, deep inside that. By the way, maybe you can't tell, but those jars are about that tall, that big around. They're big jars. And I thought, that red ball is probably way deep down inside the center of that. I'll never see it. And it came to me, and I shook it, there's the red ball. Just, I just shook it a few times and there it was, just like that. You think one minute in two years is good enough? My friends, it's not good enough. We cannot hide our sin. Hmm. That's the bad news. But Paul has for us the good news. Here's a diagram of Romans chapter 6. The way I've been talking about the way of thinking about sin and purity in those bottles is what we can call the old system. Paul calls it the flesh. The flesh is the old system, and it works like this. We have sin. 
Notice, please, sin with a capital S. This is referring to our sin nature. Not the sins that we actually do, but our sin nature. Singular with capital S, our sin. We are sinful. That is our very nature, sin. The result of, of having this sin nature is that we commit, we do sins. Notice, please, sin with a small, small case S and plural because we all commit many sins. So the, the big problem is our sin nature. But our sin nature inevitably can't be avoided. Automatically, we commit sins. There's no way to get off that path in the old system. We're sinful, we commit sins, and inevitable, the result, the result inevitably, can't get away from it, must happen, must follow, is death. That's the track we're on when we think about those bottles and our sin. But there's good news. There's good news because there's a new system. Let's get on the new system. The new system looks like this. It is life in the Spirit, and it's characterized by grace. So whereas before our nature was sin, now our nature is grace. And the inevitable result of grace is holiness. So just like sin produced sins in the old system, now grace produces holiness in the new system. In the old system, you didn't have to think about, shall I sin today? No. Automatic. In the same way, in the new system, we don't have to think about, shall I be holy today? It's automatic. It's the automatic result of grace, the grace nature that God placed in us. And the inevitable result of that is eternal life. So we live in grace. It's like a, it's like a place that we live. <laughs> and some people like to, like to uh, be tourists. Are, are, are you a tourist kind of person? You like to go visit other places? Go visit uh, uh, Hong Kong or go visit uh, United States or Australia. Some Christians like to visit the old country, <laughs> the old place, sin. Paul is saying, no, don't go back to the old system. The inevitable result of the old system is death. Let's live in the new system. That doesn't mean that from time to time, because of the already not yet kingdom in which we, in which we live, yes, yeah, sometimes we, we stumble and fall. But that doesn't mean we live in that country. No. Let's live in grace. That's what God is calling us to do. So when we consider holiness and purity in the New Testament, First of all, remember Jesus' view of purity. I like to call it offensive. <laughs> or maybe I should say it a little bit differently, offensive. That is to say, Jesus' purity extends out. It's not defensive. So often our imitation holiness, our imitation purity is defensive. We have to defend against all of the impurities that might, that might attack us. But for Jesus, His purity is on the offense. I touch you and you're pure. I touch you and you're pure. I touch you and you're pure. Let's be like Jesus on that. And for Paul, holiness is the automatic result of living in a new system of spirit and grace, the result of which is eternal life. Friends, let's live in grace. Let's allow God's grace to produce in us the holiness that we long for.